Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to a Reagan Forum, hosted by the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. The Center for Public Affairs offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. This Reagan Forum podcast that you are listening to is only one of the eight different podcasts that the Reagan Foundation and Institute produces. Have you watched or listened to our Reaganism podcast yet? Reaganism is dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today, hosted by the director of the Ronald Reagan Institute, Roger Zakheim. The show has two goals, understand the foundations of the political philosophy that powered the Reagan Revolution, and host discussions about contemporary issues through the lens of President Reagan. Episodes come out weekly. In a recent episode from August 5th, 2024, Roger sat down with Matthew Cottonetti, who serves as the Director of Domestic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. They discuss the historic 2024 presidential campaign and how the election might unfold in November. They also talked about national conservatism, energy around Kamala Harris, the Democratic Convention, and more. Let's listen. Matt Cottonetti, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Well, we love having you on Reaganism, uh, expert in Ronald Reagan and all things uh, the conservative movement. Uh, your book, The Right, of course, we discussed probably the last time you were on uh, the show. And with the craziness in our national politics, uh, we thought you'd be the ideal person to come here and organize all of this for us and help us think, think through it uh, as we march towards our November presidential election. Of course, uh, you're doing this at American Enterprise Institute, uh, where you are the chair in American Prosperity. That's a Patrick and Charlene Neal chair in American Prosperity. And of course, that's what we're all hoping we're marching towards. And we'll see if how this election impacts uh, that. But have you in your lifetime, uh, Matt, seen a crazier presidential election? And as you think about uh, your look, particularly at 20th century American history and the conservative movement, have you seen uh, a, a crazier period through that lens? Well, the short answer is no, not in my lifetime. I'm 43 years old. So I uh, kind of appeared on the scene along with Ronald Reagan's presidency. <laughs> and, you know, in retrospect, Reagan's presidency kind of ended a period of great instability and turbulence in American politics that began with the Kennedy assassination in 1963, went through the 1968 election, the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr., of RFK, uh, then, of course, uh, Watergate, Jimmy Carter's chaotic presidency, the only unelected president, Gerald Ford, who was elected to neither the vice presidency nor the presidency. So Reagan's pres presidency, because it was a success, um, because he was such a historic figure, kind of put the lid on the boiling cauldron of American politics, really, for about 30 years. But th there has not been a presidential election like 2024 since, I think, 1968. Um, yeah. And there are some similarities. We had the assassination attempt on Donald Trump in uh, July of this month. And, of course, there were successful assassinations, unfortunately, that led to great social instability uh, during that year. And then, of course, in March of 1968, Lyndon Johnson, the incumbent president, said he would not pursue nor accept the Democratic nomination. And uh, 56 years later, uh, we have Joe Biden saying that he would not accept the Democratic no nomination after having pursued it. So in a way, Biden's decision to drop out of the presidential race with a about 100 days left to go is even crazier uh, than Lyndon Johnson's, which occurred at the beginning of the primary cycle, and there was a full primary. So the Democrats have now coalesced around a nominee, a presumptive nominee, Kamala Harris, who has won as many Democratic primaries as Donald Trump has. <laughs> Zero. So you got right there a great framing, um, both historical and kind of where we are today. Two out of the big three I want to discuss. Of course, the attempted assassination of President Trump and Biden dropping out and the ex 
presumptive nomination of, of Kamala Harris uh, as a Democratic nominee. But there was also J.D. Vance, uh, yeah. which from a historic standpoint perhaps is not as significant as the first two. But yeah. as someone like yourself, Matt, who has a really deep and sophisticated and, and, and studied understanding of The Right, your last book, J.D. Vance is highly consequential as a selection. So let, let's start there, and then I'll work back into uh, Harris, and then we'll also talk about the attempted assassination of Donald Trump. But J.D. Vance, uh, as the running mate, uh, is a really big decision and high, uh, consequential move for the future of the conservative movement in the Republican Party. It, it, sure. Uh, and a lot depends, of course, on how uh, well Vance does in his new role um, and whether the Trump Vance ticket wins in November. But let's just start with some facts. Uh, J.D. Vance is the youngest vice presidential nominee since Richard Nixon in 1952. Um, he has less experience, though, than Nixon did when uh, Eisenhower chose Nixon to be his running mate in 1952. Nixon, of course, had started off in the House, being elected in 1946, and then moved up to the Senate. A few years later, he had already become a national figure over the Chambers Hiss controversies. So J.D. Vance is uh, young. He's 40. He'll turn 40 years old a few days after we record this podcast. Uh, he's he, with very little experience. He just came to the Senate uh, last year, 2023, uh, having been elected in uh, 2022. And um, he also uh, is the first millennial uh, to appear on a presidential ticket which um, is kind of uh, much to the chagrin of members of the Gen X or edge millennials like myself, you know, who are kind of... Oh, is that what, um, edge millennial? I was yes, curious. That, you know, because yeah. if, if you're born in 80, 81, you're kind of technically a millennial, but not really because, you know, we came of age in the 80s and 90s, just like the Gen Xers in a way, just a few years younger. So, you know, edge millennial, that's that's how I identify, Roger. I, and, think, I uh, think that's a huge opt-out because then you, you know, you can kind of... Opt into whatever's convenient and then reject no, whatever no, you no. want to be associated There's, well, with. Well, look, I don't want to get us too far off track, but I think a great heuristic is, did you go to college before Facebook? <laughs> and if you if you went to college before Facebook, you're not a true millennial. I think that the true millennials went to college when Facebook was a huge thing. In any case, that's <laughs> Vance. That's Vance. He turns yeah. he turns 40 uh, this August, and so he is a millennial uh, generation. Um, it, what is the significance the, uh, of the Trump pick? Because it's not a conventional pick. You know, it was it was unsurprising in some ways. I mean, the conventional wisdom had kind of coalesced around J.D. Vance for some time. He had very strong advocates in the inner circle of Trump world, including Don Jr. pushing for him. But it doesn't really fit the normal frame of a vice presidential selection. Um, it's not one to expand the coalition. Right. Uh, to put new states into play. Ohio is a very red state. It's been Trumpified now since 2016. Um, it's not really a uh, bridge building exercise within the party. Right. Sometimes like when Ronald Reagan chose George H.W. Bush in 1980, he wanted to show that he could reach out to a different wing, um, uh, uh, the more kind of Ford Nixon wing of the Republican Party with with Bush. Well, if that had been the case here, uh, the obvious choice would have been someone like Nikki Haley, right? I mean, to, to kind of build the bridges and heal wounds within the Republican Party. And it's not quite a double down because even though J.D. Vance is MAGA, he's not quite like Trump. I mean, he's uh, he doesn't have the business. I mean, he's a investment guy and has a startup and such, but he didn't quite have that CEO profile that Trump has, you know, um, the, the strong business executive. He's a writer. He's a, a storyteller, someone whose life was turned into a, a movie. Mm -hmm. I think that appealed to Trump. But it, it, what is it about? I think what the J.D. Vance pick was about in the end was solidifying the America First brand on the Republican Party. Trump is constitutionally term limited. 
Um, they're not going to change the Constitution. I, I, I hate to say it uh, for the Trump fans, but uh, he will have four more years in office if he wins in November. And that means 2028, if Trump wins, will be an open race. And so with J.D. Vance as the incumbent vice president, as we're seeing on the Democratic side this year, that would immediately push Vance into the front runner position for the nomination. And that would extend the MAGA influence on the Republican Party for at least another four years. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, Matt. And I, I, the formulation that it solidified the brand is the most consequential and, and kind of best way to explain what is going on here. Because all the traditional ways you would make a vice presidential selection, he wouldn't come to the top. I am curious, though, how much that matters to President Trump, how much he thinks of it in those terms. Um, and I guess on the one hand, J.D. Vance's story is very much something that I think uh, President Trump would internalize and think it as a continuation of the brand. You know, explaining Appalachia, mm -hmm. uh, the American worker uh, the, the class of Americans that the elites had forgotten. That all makes sense to me. Maybe that is the, is the full extent of what you mean by solidifying the brand. But when you look at what J.D. Vance stands for, certainly J.D. Vance as Senator J.D. Vance, he is, is, is advancing a set of ideas that many of those in the MAGA movement push forward and talk about, but are not necessarily the sorts of policies that President Trump uh, is kind of ideologically bound to. Tariffs, yes, but foreign policy, uh, taxes, and I'm sure you could spout a dozen other examples, Matt, where J.D. Vance has decided views, has said this is what it means to be a MAGA Republican and where the populists want to go, but at the end of the day, uh, are probably not the sort of thing that Donald J. Trump uh, feels deeply uh, beholden to. I think that's largely right. I would say a few more things um, about what might have appealed to Trump. Um, there is the extension of the brand. There's also the look. Trump really likes uh, characters in politics who have a certain look. Um, Trump liked the fact that Vance lost a lot of weight in, in the past few years. He's talked about how much he likes Vance's blue eyes. Uh, when Brian Kilmeade of Fox asked Trump about uh, Vance's beard, Trump said, he looks like a young Abraham Lincoln, right? So the, the look, Trump is, of course, always visual. And so he liked the look of J.D. Vance. And, and no mustache alone. Right. And no glasses, right? So yeah, no those glasses. disqualifying yes, of features, yes, of course, well are not aware. a problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, as a glass, uh, as a bespectacled person. Hey, you and me, my friend. Um, so there's that, the look. Um, there's also loyalty, okay? And so... I think that what was communicated to Trump uh, by Vance's advocates within the Trump world and that Trump kind of got, even though, of course, Vance has his whole history of saying really nasty things about Trump in the past, is that Vance is going to be loyal to Trump and to a certain vision of what MAGA and America First means. And in a few issues in particular, the border, I think, um, is mm -hmm. extremely important. Uh, non-interventionism, if we can call it that, is very important. Um, you know, Trump has that kind of Jacksonian mindset, you know, no better friend, no worse enemy. Uh, he'll take out Soleimani, he'll take out Baghdadi, but for the last eight years, he has been very wary of large-scale foreign entanglements, right? And I think that J.D. Vance has a similar uh, worldview. Um, and then there's a question about the working class Americans and how uh, they ought to be treated, how government ought to deal with them. And what I think Trump saw in Vance is someone who comes from that background, came from a kind of a very disruptive early life um, that he writes about in his book and you can see in the movie, uh, but that he succeeded. And so Trump wanted someone who came from that, the world of the, of the working class and who also really kind of centers their stories, as they say in uh, the faculty lounge, um, <laughs> when, he, when he makes a, a vice president selection. One of the things that I think is interesting, a twist here in, in the way people cover President Trump is the fact that J.D. Vance was anti-Trump before he was pro-Trump and the fact that 
a born again MAGA person is acceptable to President Trump, in particular, uh, enough to be uh, his vice president. It's 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 kind of a, a nuance to the loyalty test here that you might have otherwise expected. That's right. I mean, of course, uh, and you know the loyalty can always be revoked. Um, and so this is a pretty easy way of understanding Trump is that, you know, if you like him, he's going to like you. If you say good things about President Trump, he's going to, okay, well, well, we'll move on. And that's that's how Senator Vance was able to meet with Trump after in 2021 and eventually obtain his endorsement in the very hotly contested primary for the Senate seat that he eventually won. The big story here, though, Roger, is um, Vance's rollout has not gone very well. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, this is this has been a tumultuous couple of weeks here. And the Wall Street Journal editorial board in particular, which, of course, wouldn't have uh, been a fan of J.D. Vance no. <laughs> uh, in terms of being the selection where they wanted uh, a, a second Trump administration to go, has you know, kind of been relishing this and somewhat covering it and asking the question, you know, was it a mistake? And will President Trump uh, look elsewhere? So give, yeah, give us your take on this and kind of explain to us where we're at. Well, I think that uh, Vance came out of the gate. Uh, there was a lot of excitement, I, I think, on the floor. Uh, at first, not everyone at the convention actually knew who he was. <laughs> but uh, they uh, once they understood that Trump had selected him, then that was good enough for, for many Republicans. And uh, I, I think his speech uh, at the convention, which seems like it was, you know, in the mists of ages past now, but it was only in a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, Vance's speech, uh, it was a little bit rocky. Um, he kind of allowed the crowd to determine his delivery. Mm. Um, and, and so it was a little bit back and forth. And um, it wasn't it wasn't what we uh, were going to see the next day when, you know, my idol Hulk Hogan addressed the Republican convention in one of the great political communications of all time. Right. Well, so, here, so clearly you're not a millennial uh, with, with, with the Hulk Hogan admiration. Right. Bro. So I'm mean, just, you know, it's hard. I mean, look, I don't want to set up an imp impossible benchmark here for Senator Vance. But nonetheless, um, the speech was not, you know, you it wasn't about? gripping. Ripping a button down shirt is really not that <laughs> difficult. Now, you could have gone toe to toe with Hulk. So, so that was the convention. But I thought they emerged from a very successful Republican convention. I mean, I, I, I wrote that it was probably the most successful RNC, at least in 20 years, maybe Without longer. Yeah. And so that was that was great. And then he ran Vance ran smack into this oppo hit that had been waiting out for cats. there for a while exactly. let's talk about the cats <laughs> his comments about how the democratic party is uh, basically run by um childless uh women and then there's several other comments about him um uh, talking about the problems uh, uh, associated in his mind with childlessness and uh women who don't have kids and uh, I wrote about these comments at the time that he made them in 2021, and I was not very happy with them at the time and uh, didn't really help my relationship with J.D. Vance. But um, I now kind of can point to what's happening and say, hey, you know, I mean, when you when you make these comments, they're going to come back to haunt you. Um, I do think a couple things. One is um, it's hurt. It's hurt Vance. There's no question about it. Two, it's important to note that the oppo is coming from the years before he was a senator. And yeah. since becoming a senator, he has not made comments quite as so um, pointed, let us say. Fair enough. But following this particular controversy he hasn't walked away from it entirely no as well and that, right? that so, point number ahead. three that makes it a little bit messier uh, yeah. you know it, which is you would expect him to respond in the way that trump responded when laura ingram asked him about vance's comments uh, the other day and trump was just like look he loves families you know right. he loves families but look if you don't have a family that's okay too right this classic trump is everybody's happy everybody's good right 
Uh, Vance, uh, in some ways, has doubled down in some of these interviews. And it's a, a unique um, response uh, because it means that the story will be um, propagated for another news cycle. And typically in these situations, you want to break the news cycle. You want yeah. to start a news cycle. It's, especially when you're dealing with you know a population that will be the difference between winning and losing. It very well could be the difference between winning and, yeah. and, and Suburban and women, yeah, Suburban for sure. Suburban women, the majority of our population. So let me go one more on, on, on J.D. Vance at the uh, convention, get your take on kind of substance of, of, of something he raised, and then we'll move on. Uh, I got hit on Project 2025 and the Trump campaign and, 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 and Harris. One of the things that came out in the speech, which I was listening for, admittedly, this is J.D. Vance's speech, but I didn't see getting a lot of coverage. But my, I expect, uh, and I know that you would have had a sensitive ear to it, is his emphasis on nationalism and this movement, uh, the NatCon movement. Um, Top of mind for me is when he was emphasizing people don't die uh, for an idea, right? You don't give your sacrifice for an idea. You sacrifice for your home and your homeland, right? And this, this thread of nationalism that is highly reflective of uh, the political community that J.D. Vance comes from and associates with in his time as senator and running as a senator in, in, the, in the Senate, which is the, the so-called NatCon movement. Did that surprise you? Um, how much of a place do you think it has... Uh, kind of in what he'll do in, in, in a uh, Trump administration, uh, or am I over-listening for, for that thread? Well, the thread was certainly there. Uh, Vance is the most prominent um, elected official who uh, is part of this national conservatism movement. He's been speaking at the national conservatism conferences oh. for many years now. Um, he just spoke a uh, a couple of weeks before becoming the right. uh, nominee at a national conservatism conference. I thought the uh, long digression in the speech about nationalism and kind of the end about the cemetery in Kentucky, where I've, I've heard, I've heard him talk about before. It, again, it, it, to me, it was, that's not quite what you expect to hear in a vice presidential speech at a nominating convention. The point of a vice president, it seems to me, in a president in a campaign setting, is to be the attack dog and to really kind right. of lay out what's wrong with the other ticket. And so, talking about one's personal philosophy is a way to introduce yourself, I think, to to voters for sure. But um, it, it was also there's some opportunity costs there, you know. And it is true that he had some good lines about how, you know, Biden had been in politics for longer than he had been alive, um, and Biden had been supportive of all these decisions that are very unpopular in retrospect, whether it's trade or um, foreign intervention in Iraq. So, I, I thought that was kind of. Um, obscured by this, these kind of intellectual arguments, right, that you find more online than you do in actual American politics in the, in the everyday concrete reality where people care about inflation, and they care right. about the border, and they care about the chaos in the world. That's what the campaign ought yeah, to stress. Yeah, I, I, clearly a missed opportunity, but also kind of instructive, at least to me, of how his story, and he's worked to integrate his personal story with a political ideology and a, and a view of what America is and is not and what Americans, you know, uh, need to defend and care about and what they shouldn't. And this tied into this, this brand of nationalism and view of the homeland. More from our Reaganism podcast on the 2024 election after this message. The Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation is the nonprofit organization created by President Reagan himself and specifically charged by him with continuing his legacy and sharing his principles, individual liberty, economic opportunity, global democracy, and national pride. We must remain vigilant and work together to share these conservative principles with younger generations. Your role is critical to move our mission forward. Thank you for your continued support. Please visit reaganfoundation.org give. That's reaganfoundation.org slash give. Now back to a Reagan Forum, featuring our Reaganism podcast on the 2024 election. Uh, we're with Matt Condonetti of the American Enterprise Institute, author of The Right, and 
thinker on all things of American politics, a go-to here for Reaganism. Matt, in the days since the convention, actually it was leading up to it as well, you've seen the Trump campaign, including President Trump himself, really distance himself. Uh, from the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025, which our listeners and viewers no doubt are aware of, which is the Heritage Project uh, coming back actually following what they did in, in, in 1979, 1980 at the Heritage Foundation with the Mandate for Leadership, a 900-page-plus book outlining policies for a future administration, they say for administration of any color, but of course everybody knew it was a plan of attack for a Trump administration. And uh, now it's been a total break to the point where <laughs> the person who was employed to do this for Heritage Foundation uh, is no longer there. Yeah. Are you surprised uh, by the coverage of this issue that the Trump campaign pushed so hard against it in some ways giving it more light than it otherwise needed to have uh, because it was something that uh, the Biden campaign, now I guess the Harris campaign, uh, were, were focusing on, but the Trump folks didn't need to necessarily indulge in it, but they seemed to. Give me your take on it. Well, I can't say I'm totally surprised uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, the f- first reason is um, Trump does not like advanced planning. It's not <laughs> okay. really his yeah. thing. yeah. And if you know Donald Trump, if you've studied him, and I've spent the past nine years spending way too much time thinking about Donald Trump and learning about him. But one thing that comes clear is he likes to improvise. He doesn't like set schedules. He doesn't like thinking too far in advance. He wants to leave as much room as possible to maneuver and to change and to uh, negotiate, right? So... I had always been of the view that people who were trying to pre-staff a Trump administration, which was a major component of Project 2025, or pre-write a Trump administration policy, which was the other big component of Project 2025, were going to be in for a disappointment because eventually Hmm. they would have to go before Donald Trump. And he would be like, well, what is this? This is not me. Which is at least to my second point, which is for a long time I've noticed a gap between Donald Trump and so-called Trumpism. And that gap has widened in the Mm -hmm. last year where Donald Trump has basically said he will not do anything on the abortion issue if he's president. It will just be left to the states, right? Right. Um, That is not Trumpism. Trumpism includes a lot of social conservatives who do want to restrict the practice of abortion. Um, Donald Trump has left open the idea raised in one podcast he gave earlier this year that maybe foreign students who graduate from American colleges should get residency permits to contribute to the American economy and to remain here and be productive. Well, that's not Trumpism, right? right? Which is not only against illegal immigration, it's also against legal immigration. And even in the world of foreign policy, which is of great concern to you and to to me, Roger, um, there's Donald Trump who says, I'm going to end the war in Ukraine, right? Um, And then there's Trumpism, which says, Zelensky's a dictator, and we need to cut off aid immediately, and Russia is actually the good guy in this I, war. I, Matt, I think this is such an important distinction. So you you can't pretend that your ideology is Trump's ideology. You should always just look at what he says. And if you look at the – it's all right there. It's in the Republican platform, right? The platform goes from 66 pages of bureaucratic consensus language the last time it was composed in 2016 – talking about every single issue under the sun, to the 2024 GOP platform, 16 pages, but in reality, 20 bullet points in all caps with a lot of exclamation points. (laughs) You know Trump wrote those. That's what he's going to do. And to think otherwise sets you up for failure. Um, I will just say one other thing about Project 2025. the, The problem became, Roger when the media started fix, fixating on Project 2025. And there were a lot of articles in the New York Times and in the Washington Post about how the, the plans for the next four years are being cooked up in the administration. 
some of these articles started appearing last year sure. and there were several statements coming from the Trump campaign saying, look, this is not the same thing. Nothing is decided until Trump decides it. And unfortunately, those warnings went unheeded by the Heritage we, Foundation. Yeah, yeah, we now end up in a situation. Well, where I want to we read the now. quote. I want to read the quote because it's it's so instructive. This is from, you know, the, the, the people leading the, the Trump campaign, including Susie Wiles, quote, reports of Project 2025's demise would be greatly welcomed and should serve as notice to anyone or any group trying to misrepresent their influence with President Trump and his campaign. Quote, it will not end well for you, end quote. Um, and I think it goes to the point you just made. Until Trump's, President Trump decides it, it does not represent President right. Trump's views. And beyond those 20 bullet points, as you said, it's kind of open season. I mean, there are general parameters. We know what he won't do, what he will, what he, what we likely will do. But there's a lot of space there, uh, and woe unto the person who who tries to uh, kind of speak for uh, President Trump. And I think that really goes to. The, the distinction you made between Trump and Trumpism. One last point on which I love your reaction to, and then we should take the last uh, moments to talk, get your take on the, the Harris campaign. At the same time that they have totally dismissed, that is, what I, the quote I just read, Project 2025. And the people behind it are probably PNG, and take them at their word, they're probably not going to have a place or a significant place in a future Trump administration. There is still probably a lot of stuff in those 900 pages that we could expect to see a Trump administration carry out. I just want to get your reaction to that. Well, I would agree with that. I mean, uh, I think the uh, real problem here wasn't so much what's in that telephone book sized volume, which I've, I have and I've read, and which, by the way, is most of it is just typical conservative priorities, yes. right? Yes, yes. That's not the problem. It was the publicity surrounding it that became the problem. With one asterisk, and that is, in Project 2025, the document, there's a lot of language about federal abortion legislation and federal pro-life pro -life initiatives. And what we know is that Trump thinks that the life issue is a a burden for him in this campaign and he wants to separate yes as and that much probably as possible. has been a big trigger i mean big trigger here and and yeah. that is affecting many races not just the presidential and however complicated that was when the opponent was joe biden it is even more difficult now that the opponent is going to be uh vice president kamala harris which is where i'd like to go for the remaining few minutes we have matt Coninetti, vice president harris i think has surprised Everyone, maybe modify that slightly. I'm sure there's some people who ex probably maybe are not surprised by this, but almost everyone with her ability to consolidate, fundraise, out of the gate. The one thing I am surprised by is that there doesn't seem to be a different approach to the campaign than what you have with Joe Biden. I realize it's the same campaign manager, but Joe Biden running and Kamala Harris running are two, even on the same platform, probably yield very different reactions. Give me your take on Kamala Harris and uh, the state of this race based on where things stands today as we enter August. Sure. Well, first I should say, you know, there is a difference between the Biden and Harris campaigns, and that is the Harris campaign has Beyonce and Megan the Stallion. So <laughs> Biden never had that. So right, she, now, she now clearly has into, the advantage You're back into there. millennial land. Yeah. yeah. You've, you've, uh, you've lost your Hulk Hogan status. <laughs> it's been pretty remarkable to watch Kamala yeah. Harris's rise. Um Within 48 hours of Biden dropping out, this uh, really historic event, uh, haven't had an incumbent not seek re-election since LBJ in 1968, have ne has never, we've never had an incumbent drop out this late in yes. the race, right? So within 48 hours of his decision being posted to Twitter slash X, uh, Harris had consolidated the Democratic Party behind her. That's pretty remarkable. And then what you saw was, the Democratic Party had like this, it's, it's still having, as we record this on July 31st, like a psychic release. The Democrats are so relieved not to have to go into November with Joe Biden at the top of the ticket that they are just unleashing 
this positive energy and enthusiasm for Kamala Harris. So you see the enthusiasm among Democrats rising. It had been in the dumps. It's now getting close to where Republicans are. You see Harris's favorable ratings spike. Um, you know, she was less popular than either Biden or Trump just two weeks ago. Now she's more popular than Biden and where she's higher than Trump in some of these polls too. And she hasn't changed. <laughs> you know, nothing. She's the, doubled down on it, best I can tell, uh, no, in terms of what she's saying. I mean, she really hasn't done anything. And you see this huge change in her favor rating. And then you see, of course, that sense of energy, unity, um, new favorability translate into a competitive election, a race that looks like it's uh, about where it was before the, that incredible debate on June 27th, where it's a horse race, you know, um, it may even be slightly more competitive with Harris, at least at the moment as we're speaking, because the Democrats are so excited and so enthused to have a candidate who is younger than Biden and who can read a teleprompter without, you know, obvious distress. And so that's that's what I'm watching. I'm, I'm watching to see how long does this exhilaration does a sugar high does this um you know this uh, this just harris hoopla last and can it last until election day M maybe it can harris hoopla uh, I, I like that certainly the democratic convention is going to be pivotal because it's going to be that moment where people are finally going to look at her want to get to know or have that critical eye in a fashion that to date you haven't had to. Well, I'll, I'll say this. The convention will be good for her because conventions are rehearsed and controlled Scripted, and programmed. Yeah. And she can read her lines and she has a certain demeanor uh, the, and uh, her voice has a certain timbre that makes people look at her like, oh, okay. At first glance, you can see her as a leader. Harris's problem is when she doesn't have the script. And that's what happened in her 2020 campaign, where she was faced with questions and which she could not handle the heat that Tulsi Gabbard brought to her in a debate. And she ended up dropping out two months before Iowa. That Harris didn't have her lines prepared in the early stages of the current administration, when she couldn't talk seriously about the border or when she kind of cooked up her great word salads there. So what I'm waiting for is when will be the first moment when Harris has to respond in an unscripted manner? Yeah. And if, if she reverts to what we know about her in the past, um, she'll stumble. And that will, that will, I think maybe be the, uh, the end of this just incredible rollout she's been enjoying. Last question, we'll go to our lightning round, uh, which I'm excited to do with you because the depth of knowledge on Reagan uh, resides with you, Matt, in this conversation. But the last question on, on the subject of Vice President Harris, it's a little surprised as of kind of where we are in the calendar, Harris seems to be inviting the debate opportunity with President Trump. And last I've read, President Trump is not fully committed and has been hedging whether or not that's something he wishes to pursue. Given what you've just said about her, you know, word salads not being great off script, we kind of know what to expect from Donald Trump in a debate. Are you surprised by that? And I guess do you expect to have the Harris-Trump, Trump-Harris debate? I'm a little surprised about his reluctance to debate. I understand how he would might want to reconsider the date and the terms and the venue of a debate, um, because I do think he has a point when he says, look, I agreed to two debates with Joe Biden. I haven't agreed to anything with Kamala Harris yet. Um, but the, he, that's what he should be saying. He should be saying, well, OK, we're going to negotiate. We're going to meet um, uh, because I do think that would be the opportunity to put her in a situation where she has she she will be forced to answer about her past views which are radical on uh climate on race law on health care on law and order right um a debate would be the place where she would have to answer questions that she might not know the answer to just think about it roger i mean she's been now the presumptive nominee of the democratic party for about 10 days 
as we record on July 31st, she has not given a press conference and she has not spoken on any foreign policy issue except for Israel. And in all in every instance of her talking about developments in Israel, she has read from a script. And as a supporter of Israel, I have not been happy with, with what she yeah, said. Yeah, that's not a script. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You and I, I did write I the script. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but what what happens when she gets a question about uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance, right? What happens when she gets a question about Venezuela and the Maduro regime? Does she know the details? Is she going to be able to answer in a compelling way? W that will be the venue. Yeah. And so I think it is in the Trump campaign's interest to debate. And I think they I think the campaign knows that and we will have a debate. Yeah. All right. Let's go to our lightning round with Matt Condonetti of American Enterprise Institute, friend of the Reagan Institute and uh, someone who has written about President Reagan most recently in his book, The Right. What have you got for us? You always have a good one. What's the poll going to be, Matt? Uh, so which which what do you want to hear? Give me a quote. A book, do you want to hear a quote? Uh, give me anything. Um, quote. Book. Okay, so I, I've been thinking a lot about uh, President Reagan's speech to Moscow State University in 1988 uh, lately, mainly it's because I've discussed that speech with Senator J.D. Vance, and I, I pointed to, uh, he was not a senator at the time, but I said there's no better definition of freedom than the one that Reagan offers in that address to the students behind the Iron Curtain in 1988. So I, I would recommend everyone read that speech. And then I, uh, just across my desk is uh, the new book called Behind Closed Doors by Ken Kachigian, one of Ronald Reagan's speech writers. And it's just a, a great read. I'm, a, I'm about a quarter of the way through it. Ken worked for both presidents, Nixon and Reagan, and he talks about their relationship, which I find utterly fascinating, but he also has a lot of great behind the scenes details about working with Reagan. And so it's just hot off the presses behind closed doors by Ken Kachigi, and I uh, recommend that as well. Fantastic. Thanks for those uh, recommendations. Matt Conne, great to have you on the show. Thanks, Roger. Reaganism can be found in audio format wherever you download and listen to your regular podcasts. In addition, it can be watched in video format on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Reagan Foundation. Simply find the podcast playlist and you'll find all Reaganisms within there. To find a listing of all upcoming events, please visit reaganfoundation.org slash events. Thank you for listening. For more information on the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute, including information on how to become a member, information on upcoming exhibits at the Reagan Library, and more information on the legacy of President Reagan, please visit reaganfoundation.org. And don't forget to like and follow the Reagan Foundation on all social media platforms. Until next week, thanks for listening, and God bless you. Don't forget to subscribe to A Reagan Forum podcast in your iTunes or Google Play stores and on other podcast platforms as they become available. New episodes of A Reagan Forum come out every Thursday. Like what you hear? Check out our Words to Live By podcast featuring radio addresses and speeches Ronald Reagan delivered from the 1960s through the 1980s. New episodes drop every Tuesday. And don't forget to follow at Ronald Reagan on Facebook, at Ronald Reagan on Twitter, and Reagan Foundation on YouTube. Also, search for us on SoundCloud and Stitcher.